everybody okay welcome back we're looking today at Jeremy Duff elements of New Testament Greek today we're in section 6.6 .6 in the chapter on the tenses and this time we're looking at some points to note about the sigma suffix you remember what we've been doing we looked in this chapter at the meaning of the different tenses present future imperfect aorist we looked at their form and how you uh, write them and in particular we noted that they're distinguished by different endings and by the use of the epsilon augment and the sigma suffix at the beginning and the end of the stem. And that then introduces a couple of complications which we looked at in the last two videos with the epsilon augment, where it gets a bit fiddly in some circumstances if you have a vowel at the beginning of the verb or if you've got a compound verb with a preposition slapped on the beginning. Now in this video we're going to look at some complications that arise from using the sigma suffix because in some verbs it does funny things. However, the good news, as ever, is that if you think hard and just concentrate for a second or two, you can start to see the rationale behind the quirky and strange things that it does, and it's not as difficult as you might fear that it is. So let's just take a look at these verbs, and let's just remind ourselves what happens, generally speaking, if you want to add a sigma suffix to a verb, for example, to make a future tense. Let's just take a verb like luo, luo, I and tie. If you want to make it future, we add a sigma suffix to the stem and then pop the ending on. Same ending, luso. All very simple and straightforward. Right, well, what happens then if you have a verb with a consonant like pi at the end of the stem? Well, here's the stem, blep. So let's try that. We're going to go blep. Oh dear, that's a bit long. There we are. Blep. Let's put the sigma suffix on and let's put the ending on. What do we have there? We have blepso, blepso. Now that is a strange thing to write in a sense in Greek because that sound, ps, ps, pi sigma, is actually the sound of a completely different letter. The letter psi. The letter psi. And what therefore happens, and this is simply a matter of pronunciation, when a sigma suffix is added to the stem of a verb that ends in a pi, the sigma, so to speak, combines with the pi to produce a psi sound. So blepo goes to blepso, sounds the same in that instance, but the ps is written as a ps, a psi, not as a pi and sigma. So it looks just like that. All very straightforward. Now you can see the rationale for that, it's just a pronunciation issue. Now then, that principle of the sigma suffix creating a somewhat unexpected letter because of how it's pronounced applies to a number of other consonants as well. And if you look at the table at the top of page 74, you will see that if you had a stem that ended in pi or beta or phi and then you added a sigma to it, you would end up with a psi in all cases. And you can see the rationale for that. Just try saying it. Well, ps sounds like ps, bzz sounds like ps and fs sounds like ps as well. So anything that's um, in technical terms is called a labial, and you notice that's what um, uh, in the footnote um, uh, on page 73, Dove points out that these uh, consonants, pi and beta, and actually feta is a kind of labial, um, made with the lips, blah, 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 these things, all labials, when they combine with a sigma, make a pus sound. And just think about it, it's like pss, pss, bzz, bzz, fs, fs. They, they all generate the, the sound in the same kind of way. And that's why they end up with the same thing. So just to summarise so far, when you add the sigma suffix to the end of the stem with a labial like pi, beta and phi, it combines with that letter to produce a psi in all cases, in all instances. And that's a matter of pronunciation. The way to remember it, the way to think about it, is simply 
that's how it sounds. And remember, languages develop over time to make them easier to say for native speakers and more intuitive to say for native speakers. Okay, so now the same principle then applies to other letters or groups of letters that come at the end of uh, the stem of verbs. And there are two other groups of letters to which this applies. There is actually an error in the table in page 74 because there's a line missing from the bottom of it. The line that is there um, uh, is the line represented by this, um, hold on, yes, right, by the verb baptizo, where if you have a stem that ends in a letter like t, d, th, z, that is to say a dental, uh, a consonant that's made by putting your tongue on your teeth, hence dental, dentist, to do with your teeth, da, 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 Ta 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 ta. Um, anything that's like a delta, a tau, z, 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 or a theta, that will produce a change as follows. So we go bap, t, well, let's try it. Try doing that. Baptizo, baptizo. Well, what kind of sound do you think is going to be? Uh, swapped in in place of that. If you try and say zzz, zzz, then what actually comes out is simply the lone sigma all on its own. And that's actually what happens. Baptizo, when uh, you add a sigma suffix to the ending, just becomes baptizo, baptizo, because it's just intuitive, isn't it? The zeta um, goes to zzz, which becomes s. And the same thing actually happens uh, slightly less intuitively if you think of a verb that ends in a delta or a tau or a theta. In all of them, the sigma sound starts to dominate, and that's actually what happens here. So whereas you get a phi, a psi, sorry, in cases uh, that end in a labial, you get a sigma alone in cases, in instances that end with a dental. So now this is the line that's missing from the table at the bottom, on the top of page 74. What happens if you have a letter like this, a g, a so-called guttural, made of the back of the throat, g, 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 or k, 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 or k, k, k. So anything that's like g, a kappa, a chi, or actually a double sigma as well, it's a bit of a quirk, we'll come to that in a second. Well, let's try it. Um, let's try writing this. Anoi so. Imagine we were drawn, just trying to add the sigma onto the stem there in the normal way to make the future. Well, what sound is actually created by those two consonants? Gz, gz, gz. Say it to yourself a few times and you realise very quickly that the sound that's created by those two consonants is that's a terrible attempt. At a xi. There we are. It's a xi sound. If you say gamma sigma, gz, 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 you actually come up with a xi. And the same with kappa sigma or chi sigma, gz, gz, gz. It all gives you the xi. And therefore, when you write anoigo in the future, you don't write anoigso, you write anoigso, like that, with the xi replacing that final consonant of the stem and the sigma. They combine together into that letter. Now that just leaves the rationale for this. What happens if you've got a stem that ends in double sigma and then you try and add another sigma to it? Well, that just looks totally ridiculous. And the way that I encourage people to remember this is you've got three S's in a row. You can't possibly keep that. You've got to change it into something. You've got three S's, three squiggles. And what's the letter that you know that has three squiggles in it? Well, it, of course, is the letter Xi. One, two, three squiggles. So that's why the double sigma ending at the end of a stem will do the same thing that the other gutturals do and combine with the sigma suffix to produce a xi sound. So all very straightforward. You shouldn't think of this as an irregularity in the verb. You should really think of this, as Duff says very helpfully, as just a peculiarity of the pronunciation and a natural way to render that pronunciation in Greek letters. 
And although you start to think, oh goodness, it looks a little bit tricky. How am I supposed to? It looks, I can't recognize the stem so easily. You will come to recognize the stem. And the way to do it is if you come up with a stem that, a verb that contains a stem that you don't recognize, like annoys or bleps, if you don't recognize it, just try the thought experiment for a second where you imagine what this could have come from if it had come from something plus a sigma. If ps had come from something plus a sigma, it would have come from a bur or a per or a, some sound like that. Oh yeah, of course it would come from blep. Oh, so provided you know your vocabulary, provided you know your vocabulary, you're going to be totally fine with unscrambling these, figuring out what the stem is and translating the words. Okay, that'll do you for now. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you want to get regular updates every time I post a new video here. And whatever you do, far more important than subscribing is keep going 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day. Learn your vocab as we're going along through the chapter. Don't save it all for the end or you'll have a nightmare fortnight trying to stuff it into your brain and it'll all leak out again. And we'll see you again next time. God bless.